kind of legislative agenda of uh, the UN in regards to health is uh, brought to a head and is usually preceded by our January executive board. Of course, this year we're not meeting in person. We had for the first time ever in our 73 year history, we had a digital uh, gathering. Uh, we had to open the meeting with a whole bunch of procedural uh, resolutions just to, in order to enable the digital gathering. But the director general had a really clear message that it, this is not uh, the COVID-19, which was the only agenda item we held um, on the, uh, the normally kind of full week agenda. Uh, it's not just a, an emergency, it's a demonstration that no, there's no health security without resilient systems and that we have to also address the social, economic, and commercial, as well as environmental determinants of health. That his point was really uh, that we're learning health is not a luxury. In many uh, national governments, the way that health is uh, put is at a basically a cost center for uh, a country. Um, it's not a reward for development. It's not something you graduate into because you've got higher uh, um, GDP per capita. Uh, but it's a prerequisite for uh, development. It's an investment both in prosperity and peace, but also in security. And I think that this is one of the main points that we've uh, talked about uh, this past uh, two days here. Next slide. So I'll go through just a quick uh, update, which I think is useful. Um, uh, as a WHO representative, you're in these days, you're semi uh, practically legally bound to present some epidemiologic in information every time you speak. But I'll then just give a quick update on some of the uh, health services and health systems guidance that's coming and some of the issues we're really wrestling with. And it'd be great to, to follow up with people afterwards uh, around uh, some of the questions and some of the issues that you may be able to help us with. Next slide. So. Um, the again part of the benefit of this is not for me to read it all but for you to be able to have it afterwards but um this is the latest uh, data that uh, we have from today or it's from last night um at, at six o'clock is when we closed the books on this but um uh we have unfortunately crossed the very sad uh, uh thresholds of over 4.5 million cases and over 300,000 deaths uh globally um and uh we have a number of countries that are they're big countries that are leading the charge, unfortunately, still in terms of the number of cases and the number of deaths, but um, uh, they're also very high per capita, especially in the US, very high per capita um, number of cases and also uh, quite high in the number uh, of deaths um, in the last uh, 24 hours, but also um, cumulatively. Next slide, please. Um, here you could see the global curve, it, uh, it's nicely now summarized um, with the different colors across different regions. And you can see um, the very kind of large contribution of the Americas and Europe um, in the global epidemic curve. Um, definite slowing within Europe um, with some of the Eastern European states still struggling, but a number of Western countries, some anyway, who've got things more under control. Uh, there is still in, uh, increasing cases, um, or uh, still cases anyway, uh, over uh, nights in, in the US, but now sort of the attention has shifted to some of the South American countries and an increasing uh, numbers in Southeast Asia, as well as uh, some in particular in several African countries. Um, the unfortunate issue is that this, uh, we've kind of hit a plateau globally um, things look different across the different regions, but uh, obviously one of the lessons we have on this is that we won't be out of this until everybody is out of this. So the fact that um, certain regions are doing better, uh, you know, it's hard to know what to, what to think of that until really the curve changes for all of us. Next slide, please. Um, so just to, to summarize a few key points uh, related to health systems challenges, and this is something we're seeing in, in France, in the UK, in Spain, in the US, but also in Peru, uh, in Chile, uh, in Ghana, in South, South Africa. Um, there has been obviously an increased demand for the related the services that are related to COVID, which are you know, intensive care and, and uh, ventilation and they, these types of hospital-based services, but there's been major disruption of routine essential services. And uh, we now are seeing big 
difficulties around medical supplies and equipment and infrastructure, partially because of the supply chain interruptions and travel and trade uh, restrictions, but also partially because of the, the additional burden of personal protective equipment in routine essential services that we wouldn't normally have had. Um, there's been a big burden on healthcare workers and, and major infection prevention and control uh, challenges. Next slide. Um, just, you know, some of the things that WHO has been working on, uh, there's been an update to uh, the, uh, the strategic preparedness and response plan. That's the world's, I mean, it's uh, uh, shepherded by WHO, but it's the world's plan for dealing with uh, uh, COVID. Um, and that uh, update has been taken on board to look at uh, some of the uh, changing of the public health measures and their applications globally, meaning the change in the quote unquote, the so-called lockdown. Um, there's been update uh, guidance on maintaining essential services and operational uh, guidance in, uh, um, that we've been working on that I'll come back to. Uh, there's been new work that we've just been working more on today. We had a, um, a very good uh, webinar with our colleagues from CDC. We're happy to pass along that information on long-term care facilities. And I think that's a big concern in the US as much probably more than a third of deaths in the US uh, were in long-term care facilities. And we've started some recent work that we would really be very interested to talk to with folks more about, about a, a sort of virtual uh, help desk for countries, a virtual uh, place to provide real-time support for uh, WHO country offices and, and our ministry colleagues. Next slide, please. Um, we have the hand hygiene uh, uh, recommendations to member states. And um, one of the issues that we continue to come back to is the need for uh, increasing uh, uh, availability of hand hygiene facilities everywhere. Um, and this is something that's as relevant in, in Manhattan as it is uh, in sort of uh, rural Niger, where I did a lot of work at one point in my career, um, that public facilities, add, it's quite clear that, that many countries um, have very limited ability to be in uh, sort of lockdown situations and that uh, living with the virus and in uh, a sort of new approach to our everyday activities has to be uh, what is going to get us through this next phase of the of the outbreak. And hand hygiene is really going to be key there. This has to be the responsibility and interest of, of um, decision makers at national levels, but at, at uh, state, provincial, and local levels. Next slide, please. The work that WHO has done um, also is not just about, and I think we need to remember this, it's not just about uh, the what happens in health facilities, but it's also about what happens uh, when health teams head out into the community. And this is a, a photo uh, from West Africa, but this um, is the a kind of scene that is going on in uh, downtown uh, LA um, in terms of uh, community health workers providing outreach social services. And these types of essential services, which are very much like police, like firemen, like others, uh, um, uh, services that go out in the community need to be thinking about how they can do that safely, what things should be stopped and how they could be the things that can't, that really need to go on, how do they keep going on? And this is particularly relevant in many parts of the world around immunization which uh, has both facility-based and outreach services, but also um, it's crucial for other services such as malaria um, and other considerations. So this is uh, some guidance we've worked on and uh, has been rolling out just this past week. Uh, and uh, again, we're looking to evaluate its, uh, its impact as we go forward. Next slide. The, the bottom line is that the overall uh, impact of COVID will be much, much broader than just the health impact. I mean, it's obviously had a massive impact on jobs, on the economy, uh, and on really all sectors of uh, society. The UN has laid it out in terms of this framework for the, addressing the immediate socioeconomic response to COVID, and it takes a health first approach. Unfortunately, we've seen, you know, in some countries, um, uh, the rather than see the, the, the wider socioeconomic response as being a continuum of health first and then these other areas such as um, looking at social protection and basic services, protecting jobs, 
uh, fiscal and financial stimu stimulus packages um, and macroeconomic policies, and then the issue of social cohesion and community uh, resilience. Rather, it's put as a either or situation. And I think it's gonna be very difficult for those countries to really work through uh, a holistic response to this uh, particular outbreak while we're waiting for uh, the, the vaccine to come. And um, I think if I can just uh, comment on that before moving on, um, we'd have to remember uh, that just getting to the vaccine is one thing, getting uh, beyond that uh, and getting it to people will be a uh, final one. And I'll close with that before we finish. But we've been looking on the next slide uh, at some of the national plans that are based on this, this work, the Strategic Preparedness and Response Plan, as well as the, uh, uh, as well as the UN framework. But um, trying to ask, you know, where are governments putting their points of emphasis and where are they um, trying to put resources? Uh, are they aligned with the, the strategic, uh, the SPRP? Are they aligned with the GHRP, which is the Global Humanitarian Response Plan? So that's the plan that looks at this work in, in a number of uh, FCV, fragile conflict affected and um, uh, states as well and vulnerable states as well as uh, other vulnerable populations and do they focus on this um, systems uh, issue and preparedness approach and you can see that um, some of the uh, uh, results that we've got uh, here show some gaps there's a number of countries that do have multiple plans um, there's uh, not all of the countries and we were only looking at a sample a small sample only about half of the countries actually aligned with all of the pillars. Um, uh, only half of them had this uh, a piece on essential health services. Um, and I think there are uh, clearly some uh, gaps that um, in terms of having a health systems approach overall. Next slide. Uh, the issue that this creates is then, um, you know, it's not that having a plan means that something happens, but if you don't have a plan, something definitely will not happen. And so this issue of uh, ensuring that essential health services are maintained and, and are uh, emphasized and that there is a, a considered and, and strategic approach to how that's done is very concerning, I think, for a lot of us. And I think we're going to be looking at a wider examination of this and collecting data on how COVID has impacted the delivery of essential health services uh, at country level We've got um, been fielding uh, data collection across uh, initially five of our six regions, but um, to all countries. And we hope by the, uh, within about a week's time to start to get some of that data back. So I'll just um, finish with this uh, last uh, slide here uh, before um, we take uh, some questions. But the, the whole idea of our work uh, going forward um, is that there's uh, the immediate response that the, the areas in blue, there's the humanitarian response for those countries that are really highly affected in humanitarian settings, the Yemen's, uh, the Venezuelas of the world. There's, um, and then there's the longer term economic recovery plan. And the, really the linchpin on this is this health first approach. The, the idea that essential health services and systems need to keep running, that that is going to be a key element in terms of ensuring that the, the recovery efforts can be actually even begun. And the idea that we've had here, it's uh, we're speaking to the UN uh, principles just uh, a little bit uh, at the end of last week, um, the, from some of the serology studies that we're seeing, only about five to 10% of our populations, and this is even in countries that have been very affected by COVID, Spain, France, the U US, only about five, to 10% of the population, the world's population, has been exposed to COVID, which means that the vast majority of the world is still very vulnerable to infection with this virus. And uh, the idea that we are all tired about being uh, cooped up and uh, about being at home and not being able to work, to the virus, it does not matter. The, uh, it will, if we go back too quickly and without enough preparation, come roaring back. And we've shown that we can control the virus. In many countries, there's been good efforts at controlling it. But the virus has also shown that it can control us. And the promise of a vaccine, things are moving very quickly in some countries. 
there's hope that uh, that we can get to a certain point um, uh, in early 2021. Um, but uh, there's also talk um, in certain uh, government circles about earlier than that. But just to remind, at the beginning of uh, or at the end of December of last year, uh, in Samoa, for instance, a country with very limited capacity in terms of uh, intensive care beds and ventilators. It had 15 intensive care beds for the whole country with ventilators. All of them on December 31st of 2019 were filled, but not obviously with COVID patients. It was filled with young children under fives who were suffering from measles. And we've had a measles vaccine since 1946. So the idea that the creation of this vaccine will suddenly solve all our problems is not the case. We will need to think of health systems approaches and vaccination approaches that uh, innovative ways of delivering the vaccine, uh, packaging and delivering, and innovative ways of ensuring that health systems support that, uh, both between now and then, and then following uh, the creation of the vaccine. So I'll close with that, um, with the the encouragement to stay vigilant and to keep uh, working together and happy to take some questions, Donna. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Ed. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first question is um, related to the slide that we were just looking at. What does SPRP mean on that slide and HRP? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you know, WHO, you're all just like you're uh, required to uh, use numbers in your presentations. You're also required to only speak in acronyms that nobody uh, understands. So anyway, SPRP, if you, look at, if you turn your head sideways, um, it means the Strategic Preparedness and Response Plan. So that's the WHO, the Global plan, uh, Response Plan for COVID. And the GHRP is the, again, turning your head sideways, is the Global Humanitarian Response Plan. So both of those our UN uh, roadmaps for, for addressing uh, COVID. One, the, the second one addresses it in the official humanitarian uh, countries of which there's about 28 of them. Wonderful, excellent. Well, we'll be sure to, to send out this PowerPoint with all of these great links that you have, but we'll also make sure that we link to it on our website as well so that people can have access to everything. Um, Another question that came in was related to um, academic studies. Um, you know, we, we're learning an awful lot through this. Is the World Health Organization looking to partner with academic institutions to better improve training for um, upcoming healthcare workers? Yeah, that is uh, something that we have been uh, definitely working on. Um, and actually, uh, the Director General and our uh, Health Workforce uh, Department have launched a very, very exciting new initiative, the WHO Academy, that will bring together uh, all of WHO's uh, work and training um, into, because of course, as you might imagine, capacity building is one of the core uh, jobs of WHO around the world in providing the technical content for that we're not always the best at delivering that. Um, and so often we depend on our collaborating centers and academic institutions. So there's a whole uh, um, global network of WHO collaborating centers on that. But the WHO Academy is recently created and um, uh, afterwards we will share the link to the Academy and it's got a new um, WHO Academy app that takes all of the COVID uh, uh, material, all of the guidance and training, and has organized it in this very easy to use app. Um, so we'll uh, provide the link on that. So that's uh, probably what one of your um, listeners had referred to uh, in the, one of the questions that came. That's great. Thank you. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll definitely post that as well. Um, another question came, comes from a patient advocate. You know, here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, we're very focused on helping to eliminate medical errors. You know, we, we know, at least here in the United States, that between 250 and 400,000 people die every year because of that. So the question is, what, you know, there is a lot of, of focus right now on COVID, but why aren't medical errors, preventable medical errors, do you think, getting the same attention? Hmm. Getting the same attention as, uh, as COVID, meaning? Right, yeah. Knowing, yeah. knowing that, you know, that hundreds of thousands of people are dying every year, um, but it, yet, when you talk to most people, they are not aware that this is a problem. Yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting uh, point and great point to bring up here with the Pace and Safety Movement Foundation. Obviously, we, um, in peacetime, in peacetime and in wartime, uh, are working a lot with, uh, with the foundation 
um, and the the and I started at WHO to work uh, on the World Alliance for Patient Safety. I think that um, it has to do with the sort of the nature of the outbreak and the the controllability, um, or at least the perceived controllability uh, that is out there. That um, in the same way that a um, that an airplane crash uh, gets much more uh, gets big news, but the the drip 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 of um, car uh, road safety uh, deaths does not. Um, I think it's that aspect that uh, that is principally behind it. Um, I think also there's a perception that COVID there is or will be sort of a magic bullet um, around it and it'll be, you know, it'll, a vaccine will come and we'll be able to kind of uh, start working on eliminating it um, uh, or something like that, like smallpox or something. But um, whereas the solutions for, for preventable deaths in, in healthcare are sort of multifold and systems related here, we can blame it on one uh, virus. Um, so probably those two, that's probably not the full answer, but I think that's part of it. Um, and I think uh, um, if we can um, uh, try and see one of the lessons for our, for our future work for patient safety would be to say, look, this is all about patient safety. Getting back to safe provision of healthcare will be the key to this. Um, and we should take some of the lessons on infection prevention and, and what we're gonna need to do in this context of COVID and translate those into other other areas of uh, safety issues. Um, so I think we have a big opportunity here. I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think that this is going to provi provide us with an opportunity to really understand how systems impact care. Um, as you mentioned, systems are usually the the, the root cause of uh, of patient of patient errors. Um, Another question for you is related to who webinars, the World Health Organization, do, do you do any kind of webinars for the public that people may be able to share with family and patients? Yes, definitely. We have, um, there on the website itself, there's a whole uh, for, the, uh, for the public uh, section of the website um, that uh, has a set of videos for things like it's putting on and taking off masks and please, please go to that website. I cannot tell you, living in France, there's just been um, the request for people to wear, you know, masks and public transportation and, 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 and in stores and that kind of thing. And I cannot, and WHO, as people probably know, has, has been quite clear to say that the evidence from previous outbreaks and uh, H1N1, et cetera, shows that I, on the whole, the wearing of masks by people who aren't sick doesn't really prevent. Obviously, it does, no, does not do any harm, but it does do harm if you don't know how to put them on or take them off and you wear them in crazy ways. And the minute you come out of the store, you touch your face, taking it off and put your phone on and all that kind of stuff. So please go and watch that before you start wearing your mask everywhere. But so there's a bunch of videos, but then the WHO does have its EpiWin team, the sort of the infodemic uh, fighters, um, uh, has have regular uh, EpiWin um, uh, seminar webinars, and I'll just um, we'll have uh, our colleague, uh, my colleague Zen Billy, who's here, who can can um, uh, make sure to put the link uh, on in the chat box, or we can also provide it afterwards. Great, excellent. Um, in terms of uh, workers who are having to go back to work this month, I know you talk a lot about hand hygiene. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there may be some concern for those who don't feel like it is safe yet to go to work, but yet they're required to. Any mm -hmm. recommendations on what they can do to, uh, to keep themselves safe? Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, that's, it's a big issue. Uh, we have um, a, a health worker uh, protection and occupational health team here that's really working on some of that. It's a joint um, piece of work with the health workforce team, the occupational health team, and the International Labor Organization, the ILO. Um, uh, I mean, first and foremost, obviously, it's to express, uh, you know, through the appropriate channels, your concerns about uh, return to work. Um, and, uh, you know, in in theory, no one should be forced to, to work in unsafe conditions. And that's sort of one of the principles that the ILO has um, globally. And so that's 
that's uh, one issue. But um, when workers do go back and things open up and you're not able to, the, the biggest issue is trying to maintain appropriate distance and trying to maintain a workplace that um, is uh, only as dense as uh, you know safety allows. So to allow uh, a meter between uh, workers, WHO has um, is getting itself gradually ready by uh, looking at workflow at looking at flow along our very long hallways. So we have arrows like it's a bike path now. So one direction uh, you're supposed to go this way and one direction you're supposed to go that way rather than people crossing each other in the hallways, looking at doors and how, you know, people coming in and out of doors, looking at elevator spaces so that um, you uh, create enough space for people getting on and off, make sure that only a certain number of people uh, appropriate can ride up and down on the elevators, making sure all of that is signposted are all very helpful issues. Installing extra hand hygiene spots with, um, uh, we've just even installed here, uh, extra on the wall bottles um, with, with uh, little uh, um, framings of how to hand rub uh, using alcohol based hand rub. So all of those things can help. Um, it can help if you are, if you have to be in more crowded situations uh, for shorter periods of time to, to if, if it makes you feel be better also to wear a mask um, on occasion. Uh, and I think the, the main thing is to really look and work with your um, decision makers within your workspace about making sure that the flow, uh, particularly workflow, is, is that way. And for healthcare workers, one of the additional things that many, um, it, this depends on testing strategy, uh, that a lot of healthcare providers are moving into is to have a very clear testing strategy for healthcare workers coming back to work and a very clear uh, screening and triage uh, approach. Um, and those are two different things, as, as all of your people on this call should know about, uh, a very clear screening and triage approach for patients uh, coming in for regular health services. And all we have guidance on that. And I think that could be very useful. WHO has also guidance in terms of returning to work and for schools and other workplace institutions that, that Zen Dilly's uh, posted up there. Great. And I think we have time for just one more quick question. Um, there's you know, been a lot of talk about vaccines. We, we talked earlier about that here. Um, but there are a lot of folks in the world who are not necessarily uh, in favor of vaccinating their children. Um, so does the World Health Organization have anything that a practitioner could share with patients to help explain the purpose of, of vaccinations and, and the safety? Yes, definitely. Um, I, this is, of course, an issue that has existed for a while in peacetime and has been, unfortunately, the reason why we've seen uh, um, measles outbreaks in, in uh, European and certain countries in Europe and in uh, parts of the US um, from a disease that can be very deadly for young children, but is completely preventable. Um, and we have had this whole uh, vaccine reticence um, movements, uh, sort of what we term from a technical side, the demand side of vaccine um, or lack thereof has been an issue for us for a while. And we have several uh, good publications that are around um, both you know, explaining the benefits of vaccines, uh, explaining the safety uh, issues, um, busting some myths that have uh, unfortunately cropped up um, by, uh, anyway, around uh, vaccines and vaccine safety. So we'll be sure to, uh, to share that. And there's a good Q&A on vaccine safety um, that's available that uh, also just uh, pasted in the chat. Great. Well, we will add all of those to our resource pages. Um, and I think that's about all the time that we have. So um, Ed, thank you again. Thank you always for joining us and giving us some, you know, such great information about what's happening across the world. It's really very helpful. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Donna. It's really uh, always a, a pleasure to be with the, uh, with the foundation and it was getting a great group of people here. And so we're just uh, thankful to have the, a moment to, to talk to them. Great. Well, hopefully we will see you again in a few weeks. Good. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ed. Have a great day.